the United States of America, the great USA. Yesterday, we celebrated America's 244th birthday. 244 years old as a nation. Not sure what all you were doing yesterday. I found myself in a variety of places yesterday doing a lot of things. Some of you were involved with family picnics. Maybe you were grilling out hamburgers or hot dogs and eating some barbecue. I did get to snatch some barbecue yesterday. Maybe the kids were out there playing frisbees or volleyball, and perhaps even some of the adults might have gotten into a volleyball or badminton game. But you had all that good food there. Maybe by the time it was all over, the potato salad got soggy, and the flies died because they ate too much yesterday, and there were enough of those floating around. But I'm trusting that yesterday was the day that you at least stopped and thanked God for America, for our freedom. You've told me and you've heard me tell you about places that I have been in other parts of the world. Where we don't have the freedom to come and worship uh, like we did, like, like we do here on a regular basis. So I'm, I'm mindful of the freedoms that we have came across a video this past week of a naturalization ceremony. There were some 60 participants, some 60 foreign-born individuals who were ready to take their citizenship vows. There were 33 different countries represented on that particular ceremony. They had learned the language at least to some degree, they had studied our nation's law, they had passed a test, and even passed security checks. Part of their ceremony included the Army National Guard marching proudly and carrying the United States flag. A soloist sang the national anthem, and God bless America. And then the guest speaker was a man who himself was a naturalized citizen, which made this thing about the American dream all the more special. Now, as the ceremony was getting underway, they stood before the crowd there, and they were getting ready to take their vows. But before they did so, they had to do something before they could take their vows. They had to renounce their citizenship from whatever country they had come from. And then as the ceremony was closing out after they had taken their vows, they stood again proudly on that stage and declared, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and carried out that commitment. But as they did, this is what struck me the most. Tears were streaming down their faces. I just wonder how grateful we are and how much we know what we have. When we look at our country, we're not honoring a flag or worshiping a flag. We're thanking God for the country that we have. And it is certainly a far cry from where we need to be right now. But we've got a lot of good things. Let's accentuate the good things. Let's try to improve upon the bad things. You see, I share that this morning because as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the only people on earth who can have dual citizenship. We have dual citizenship, one being a citizen of the United States of America and the other one being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I'm trusting that I'm speaking to everyone here today that are a part of the kingdom of God and do have citizenship. I realize that out there in the media world, that may not be the case. So this is a time and an opportunity to look at where you are as far as your citizenship in your relation 
to the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. The Lord himself mandated such an arrangement. You might recall that during the last tension-filled week of Jesus' life, before he was executed, his religious enemies had devised a very tough question. Our scripture this morning is coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 22. This is in that section of the book of Matthew, where the question of paying the imperial tax to Caesar. What do we do? Picking up with verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now Jesus, knowing their evil intent, replied by saying, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is on this, and whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. And then he said, So go back. And give back to Caesar that that belongs to Caesar. But give to God what belongs to God. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. Should we pay taxes to Rome or not? Now you need to dig into this a little further here. If he said no, no you do not then his death sentence would have been sealed right there. Because the occupying power there in Palestine, which was the Roman Empire, allowed no dissent from this situation. But then, on the other hand, if Jesus advised that the taxes be paid, it would alienate all the Jewish patriotic groups. And those Jewish patriotic groups would be much like what we have today in the equivalent of the American Legion, the uh, VFW, the Veterans of Foreign War, or the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. And that would be uh, equivalent to what we're talking about at that day and time of the Jewish patriotic groups. And they, they, they resented having to support these pagan Romans who had conquered their country and had killed their people. But notice Jesus threw the question back at his interrogators. And he laid down what I would call a pretty profound principle right here. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render unto God the things that are God's. So here we see these adversaries Uh, of the Lord here, being left to decide for themselves what belonged to Caesar and what belonged to God. Uh, In other words, if I could explain this a little bit more, both God and the nation was legitimate. They had legitimate claims, but there was one that had superiority over the other. Now today when we think about dual citizenship, in our citizenship in a great country and our citizenship to the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What does that entail? What are my responsibilities? What do we owe our country? Now, there's really a whole lot more that I want to say, and I may carry out another portion of this uh, maybe next week, but sometime uh, I'm real soon. What do we owe our country? Based upon where we are and the citizenship that we have, the freedoms that we have, who we are and our obligations, what do we owe our country? Well, first of all, let me say, you need to know and understand the importance of reclaiming 
and giving meaning to the words of our national motto, One Nation Under God. Now, in our 9 o'clock service this morning, Dwayne led the music, and Dwayne was uh, making reference to uh, how God is just being pushed out of, of everything. I am convinced that the authors of our Constitution did not intend for America to be a secular, godless America. Church membership across the country have reached an all-time low. Right now, according to, to polls and statistics, for whatever they're worth, but I think there's some value to it, church membership across the country has reached 50%, an all-time low. And one out of every five Americans do not identify with any kind of religious group. However, we are told that almost 90% of our American citizens claim to believe in God. But then, on any given Sunday, we'll only have an average of 34% of those who claim to be believers in God attend any kind of religious services. I think about where I was. I thought about this morning, sitting in my office real early, just going over some things, and how church has changed in my time in ministry. From the day that I felt the call, it wasn't a specific day, but the time that I felt the call into ministry and how important church was of where we were as a nation and all the things that have happened in my right at 48 years in ministry kind of makes me wonder what our nation is going to be like, what our churches are going to be like 48 years from now. How strong are we going to be? Are we going to be standing on the Word of God or are we going to be melting like butter? Several years ago, in a town in New Jersey, the third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that a senior class in that high school could not, could not have a non-sectarian prayer at commencement. The senior class had already voted on what they could say. And the prayer was this, quote, verbatim. Please bless us in the future. Thank you for the blessings of the past. God keep a watchful eye on us in the future. Amen. End of prayer. But... The ACLU ruled it unconstitutional, and so did the third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. You know, I look at that, read that, and I thought, surely, surely the writers of our Constitution did not intend to prohibit 17 and 18-year-old boys and girls from saying a prayer that they had elected to say themselves. But now the principal of the high school in that New Jersey town had the last word. At the end of the commencement, when things were ready to be dismissed, he stood up before that class of graduating seniors and declared, God bless you and God bless the USA. And immediately every one of those graduates stood up and applauded. Wasn't much they could do about it at that point. But listen, my friends. As a nation, we cannot take God out of our nation. We're trying. I say we. I'm not a part of that we. I don't think you are. But they're trying. And see where it's getting us. We are further and further and further getting away from a relationship, from the reality, from the importance of having God in the center of our lives, individually, as a family, as a nation. So why is it so important that we have one nation under God? But well, God is the source of our liberty, and God is the source of our knowledge of understanding right from wrong. 
And that standard of right and wrong is our only valid absolutes that we have from God. Let me read a quote from you from Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson, as you might know, was the father of the separation of church and state. But even he knew that the belief in God were essential for a nation. Beginning a quote. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that their liberties are a gift from God. Our freedoms are a gift from God. Well, listen. If freedom is not God-given, if freedom is not inalienable, then those freedoms can be taken away at any time by anybody who says it's politically right to do so. If there are no absolute standards of right and wrong in our world, if there are no unchanging principles given by God, then we're left to make our own decisions. We're, we're leaving it to our own opinions, and there's no authority in our opinions. There's a standard of right and wrong. Someone has said if there is no God, then everything is permitted. Well, that might be why we're just trying to take God out of everything, so we'll be permitted to do anything we want to do. You don't need me telling you today that America is in a cultural battle, battling for her own soul. And this was long before what we've seen here in the last few weeks. To be honest with you, that's happened a long, long, it's been going on for years, but we see it escalated. And we're going to be talking more about uh, uh, prophecy and where things are. Um, i got to say, Caleb, thank you. Wednesday night was absolutely marvelous. I wasn't here. I had a funeral in, in Indiana. He covered for me, and I've heard nothing but good about that. But there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of concern. People are interested about where we are as a nation, where we are in relation to end times. What's happening? Got a phone call two or three yesterday. Now, what's happening? What's happening in our world? Well, I think that we need to be focusing in on that and getting to a point where we're getting serious about our relationship with God. Is there a transcendent standard of right and wrong given by God that is authoritative? I mean, do we have that mindset? There is a standard here of right and wrong. It's given by God, and that is our source of authority. Or do we leave it up to our own ideas and whatever he believes or whatever she believes is what they can do? One nation under God. One nation under God doesn't mean that you're pouring religion down somebody's throat. But it does mean that we are openly acknowledging the power and the presence of God and unapologetically allowing godly principles in our laws and in our policies. The soul of America depends upon it. Well, then I, I see this. Well, we need to accentuate the good. Uh, we need to accentuate the good things that's going on. Now, most of the time, the conversation of the day will be whatever the headlines were when you turn the TV on or you turn your news app on every morning. Whatever those headlines are, more than likely, that's going to be the source of conversation whether it be at the gas station uh, pumping, uh, pumping gas somewhere or whether it be uh, the office, work, coffee shop, barber shop, beauty parlor. The conversation of that day will more likely be what the headlines were that day. And let's face it, media doesn't point out the positive stuff. And anything we're going to get is going to be the negative. But it should be our intention 
to look upon the things that are going good. What are the things going on good in your own life, in your own family, in our own church? And I'll be honest, I can't wait for the day. And I'm hoping that it'll come when we can get back to some kind of normalcy. You know, I, I, I wear my, my mask when I need to. And up here, I don't really need to. But I, I long for a day when I don't have to worry about masks. I, I, I worry about, uh, or, or I long for the day when we can have ministry like we've had. We've taken it for granted so often, so long. When we can openly have people making professions of faith and stirring the waters of baptism and openly coming down, coming forward and saying, I, I recommit my life to the Lord. We're all afraid to do that right now. But along for the day when we can get back to having Sunday school and doing things that we so badly and desperately need. So I want to encourage you, when you hear all the bad stuff going on, let's think about some good stuff. Because chances are, if all that you hear is bad, you'll be bringing up the bad stuff in your life, in your home, in your family. Let's accentuate the good things. And then, lastly, we as Americans, we've got to demonstrate how to disagree without demonizing or vilifying our opponents. The anger, the resentment, the prejudices are so pathetic. The divisiveness in our country is corroding our unity. It's corroding our strength. It's corroding our effectiveness. The level anger in our nation is heightening. Race relationships are increasingly getting worse, it appears. And in our country, so many people believe that the government is essentially the enemy. America just needs to get back to God. America needs to get back to a relationship with God. One nation under God. Some of you might remember, and I've, I've talked to a lot about this. I, I did, a, did a sermon here probably 20 years ago. I've used it in some revivals before, thinking about where we were in the 60s as a nation. And then I went from the 60s over to the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. I need to revamp that, carry it over into where we are right now. But where we were as a nation and where we were then, as opposed to where we are right now. And I know that not everybody is going to uh, be thrilled with what I say today. You can keep your hate mail to yourself and your, your nasty um, um, uh, Texas to yourself. Not that I expect any of you all to do that, but, but sometimes I get those uh, because of what I say and what I believe. But I believe that a turning point in our country was when we uh, took prayer out of school. And it was a turning point uh, in our understanding of who God is and the importance is. So what do we do? What's the answer? Well, I wish I knew a real quick answer that would solve all of our problems. But, see, we, we see people wearing their feelings on their shoulders. And if we don't believe the way they believe or they don't believe the way I believe, we automatically become enemies. You know, and that's not where we need to be. You know, some of you do not agree on the things that I believe. That doesn't make me an enemy of yours or you an enemy of mine. But let's exercise godly principles and do what we need to be doing individually. And the nation is only as good as we are individually. You know, if we fall into that, the bad stuff, that trap, then it's not going to better our nation so let's not just wait for somebody else to develop some kind of plan for unity and support let's be doing what we need to be doing individually in our own lives at work at home in the community and allow that to affect us as a nation and we need to be praying I'm getting ready to get involved with something uh, from another another preacher and talking about prayer 
and, and we're in need of prayer right now as a nation, and the churches need to be involved in prayer more than ever before. And we've talked about it. We've done a good talk of talking about it over the years. But now we need to start doing it. Our world, our world's in chaos right now. Many people are frightened. There's a multitude of people suffering from a number of things. From day to day, we wonder what the next horrific headline is going to be in the news. But I'm convinced that as we band together under the banner of God's word, living out his word, I'm not going to be able to reach everybody out there with the gospel. But together, you and I can band together in unity, sharing Christ's love, making a difference out there in the world. And then troubled people, people that are looking for answers, people that are searching, hopefully can find the love and the peace in their hearts that only come from a relationship with God. There's that unconditional love that Christ offers us. And when we can take that unconditional love, we can expose them to the saving power of Jesus Christ. One nation under God. Will it ever happen? It won't if we don't ever try. Let's do our part in being the nation that we need to be, the individual that we need to be for the cause of the kingdom. Shall we pray?